forget safety, live where you fear to live, destroy your reputation, be notorious. Rumi said it well, welcome holy fools and holy fools in training, happy holy fools day. <laughs> I'm Gail Larson, and I am your presiding holy fool today as we talk about how to get your voice out into the world in your own original, amazing way so that you're living the life you came here to live. If you're ready to become a wildly unforgettable person, speaker, and change artist, the one your soul is asking you to be, you are in the right place for inspiration. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to introduce our five holy fools. We're going to have a conversation about answering the call of the holy fool. There'll be some questions to inspire your own holy fool for those of you who are watching. And we're going to have a conversation where each of our holy fools is encouraging you each step of the way to inspire that part of yourself that has something to say, something to do, and that you want to show up fully in this life doing it. So, as I introduce our fools, I'm going to ask them why they're a holy fool. What happens for me in the process of transformational speaking is I get to hear not just the stories you hear from a stage or that you see on someone's website. I get all the stuff in the backstory. And as I hear the stories that sometimes aren't so public, and I am touched and moved by people who are so willing to risk and to try something they've never tried before, to step fully into their passion and calling, I always want to share that with others. Joseph Campbell said the holy fool is the most dangerous person on earth. She won't be stopped. She will not listen to naysayers. She's going to do what she's here to do no matter what. The holy fool is also the most dangerous to all hierarchical institutions because you know what? We don't play by their rules. And that's the way we step forward repeatedly in building and creating the world that we want to be part of. So holy fools are changing the world one brave step forward at a time. And it's such a thrill to introduce you to these five holy fools, beginning with... Diana Chapman. <laughs> Diana's new book recently came out, 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. I want you to read it because one of Diana's holy fool actions in the world is you know all that stuff we've been learning that we think is our personal growth and our spiritual growth? She brings it into companies and asks people to stand up and their fullness, and their vulnerability, and their leadership to create change. But there's something else about Diana that was one of my favorite stories that I learned probably just four or five months ago. Diana was a stay-at-home mom. She had two kids, a working husband. She, things were fine, except her husband, Matt, wasn't very turned on and happy. And Diana, being the holy fool she is, said, I wonder what it would take for Matt to really start loving his life. When she asked him, he said, I don't think I can find my way in this job from here to there. So I think what it would take is for you to make enough money to support the family so I can take some time off and just see what's calling me. Diana asked the question, how much money do I need to make? He said he gave her an amount, and he said you have to do it for three months before I can trust it. It took Diana six months to build a business from nothing to support her family 
so that Matt, too, could step into his holy fool calling. Mm -hmm. Diana, anything you'd like to add to that as you tell us why you're a holy fool? Well, that was one of those... Uh moments like many moments in my life where I had no idea how I was going to do it. It seemed in some ways impossible. But I have this part of me inside that says there's got to be a way. There's got to be a resolution and my job is to go find it and uh, somehow it always works out. Uh, taking those next leaps into the unknown and my job is to stay deeply curious and to play with it all and not take anything too seriously. Great holy fool wisdom. Thank you. Our next holy fool is Manuel Makeda. Manuel is from Spain. He did all the stuff he was supposed to be doing, the law degree, the business degree, and you know what? It just didn't get it for him. So he followed a girlfriend to California and he's been a holy fool ever since. I will say from a personal perspective of Manuel as a holy fool, he got married last year and within three or four months he decided to leave his new wife for a week and come take care of me while I was recovering from surgery and I thought that's a holy fool. He knows a lot about good relationship. Manuel, why are you a holy fool? Wow, well, good question. I think as the kind of uh, animal I am. You know, I breathe it, I live it, it's in a uh, in every pore, it's in my DNA, and uh, it just took me a while to really come into my holy fullness in my life, but I couldn't live any other way. It's just as, yeah. as I grew and, uh, and stepped into my, my own being, I, I was convinced I'm here to do this, to follow my passion, to follow my heart. And you do it in so many ways. Manuel was the one who inspired Chris Jordan, our holy fool, last year who went to Midway Island for his photography of this great plastic garbage patch and the albatross chicks that can't grow because of what we're doing to the planet. And I've seen you, Manuel, behind the scenes on so many important initiatives. And one of the things you say that, I always, that always strikes me is about in a world where we're always focused on doing and having there's no place for deep wisdom to emerge. So thank you for being a place in my life where we're always exploring the deep wisdom and seeing how we can bring it to a world that needs us. Marie Forleo, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I've known Marie from her B-School as many of you have. Her online presence is so strong with so many. Last year Inc. named her B-School one of the fastest growing companies in the country. But Marie, when I got a chance to, to know you and work with you, what so touched my heart was how you have been inspired over time to build your business not on how much you get, but on how much you give. Tell us a little a bit about that and why you know you're a holy fool. Gail, thank you for that intro. And, you know, for me, there was something I realized uh, years back, and it's this idea that's been shared many times, and it's that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And the more I opened my eyes mm -hmm. to the realities of our world beyond the Western world and beyond the United States, and even sometimes here in the United States, that there are so many people that have a gift to give, that have desires and dreams, but they don't have the opportunities that many of us had and were born into just by luck of the ovarian lottery. So for me, what's <laughs> really exciting is how do we collectively look out for the whole to ensure that our other fellow human beings who are just as intelligent, just as passionate, just as loving, just as creative, have a chance to have a truly fulfilling life that is full with opportunity and possibility so that they too can live the life of their dreams. And for me, I feel like it's all of our responsibilities to take care of this together. Thank you. Your, your leadership is shining and inspires me so what, what, what you always 
caused me to consider, Marie, is what if we all, in service of what we're wanting to create in the world, looked for our success around the question of, oh boy, the more I give, the more I can give back. So thank you for showing us how the world changes with one woman making that choice. Hmm. Thank you. So our next two holy fools, I realize I have to introduce together. They didn't really know each other too well a couple of years ago. Mike was on one side of the country in Seattle. He's a lawyer, a married man, two kids, and he just said, there's more that I want to be expressing in the world. On the other side of the country is Mary Beth Tinker, a pediatric nurse, a woman who 50 years ago appeared before the US Supreme Court when she was 13 years old and won a case for students for freedom of speech. Mike had been working with the Student Press Law Center and he knew that the kids today really didn't get how hard won this right of free speech is. So he calls up Mary Beth and he says, I have an idea. Let's hit the road together. Let's get a motor home. Let's go speak to kids. Let's do the Tinker Tour. Mm -hmm. That's when I met them. It was on a, all an idea. There was no money. There was just this vision that it was time to talk with kids. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Mary Beth. Why are you holy fools? <laughs> Mary Beth, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Gail. It's so great to be here with all of you crazy fools and holy fools today. Um, with If these times call for anything, it's a time for all of us holy fools to step up and speak up and and to take action, I think. We, we need more foolish people that are willing to buck the status quo and to say, no, there's a different way to do things. Um, for me, a lot of it had to do with just loving kids, and I like being around kids, and I started getting really upset of by just taking care of kids who were uh, paying the price for policies in our country and our world that they really had no part in making. And I thought, you know, kids should really have more of a say in our world today and I thought you know they have great ideas and they have great energy and one of those great ideas and, and ways that kids have is they're kind of holy fools themselves a lot of times because they're willing to take risk and they're imaginative and they're creative and so I thought you know not only can I advocate for kids and speak up for kids but let's listen to kids and and follow them a little bit too instead of just always trying to lead and so I started thinking maybe I should adapt a few of their ways, young ways. And, and this whole project is really one of those. It's been really great. And through that I met Gail and Mike and, and a lot of good things uh, followed. So I'm yeah, happy with all I, I think what's pretty exciting, Mary Beth, is that because of the Tinker Tour that did actually happen as you went to hundreds of assemblies and places where kids are gathering, you quit your job as a pediatric nurse and now you're a full-time professional speaker. So how wonderful in your 60s to have life open up in a whole new way because you said, why not? Let's give it a try. So Mike, tell us a bit about your, um, your way of looking at this when there was no money and it was just an idea. Well, you know, I'd never really heard of, uh, well, I heard a little bit about the holy fool archetype and everything, but never really had kind of dived into it. And um, but the more I did, I mean, I look back. I'm kind of like the holy fool poster child. I think sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I truly, I, I did. I had, uh, I had a what I thought was, and it was, it was a great lawyer job. I mean, I was helping young people, you know, speak out and learn about the law and the First Amendment and all that kind of stuff. Um, but after about 20 years of doing that, um, something changed. And I wasn't real sure what it was. I mean, I'd had such it was it was seriously it was like the one lawyer job in America that that I could just love and be happy about and passionate about and you know I did great things. Uh, it was just a great combination. But at some point that changed. 
Um, and I wasn't sure what was going on. I just wasn't as excited as I was about getting up and doing it. I mean, I just kind of been putting out fires, I guess, uh, for you know all these twenty years, and the forest was still you know burning. I mean, you know, student rights were kind of going downhill and all that. Um, and so I, I, mean, I actually got to the point where I felt myself going into depression, and I knew that something had to change. And so. Uh, I started meditating because when I was in law school, actually, because I, I never should have been a lawyer. I hate to argue, um, but I did just because that was kind of what you do. Um, but I felt when I was in law school, I went into depression and I felt those symptoms kind of coming back. And so one of the things I uh, started doing, and it was really a life-changing thing, is I didn't want to go back on pills and all that kind of thing. So I started meditating, and it was just that slowing down and and starting to listen. Um, where things just changed. And I mean, one of the first things that happened is I came up um, uh, just listening. I mean, I had this idea for this company uh, that uh, we do home history books and, and the Heirloom Registry. It's a great company, um, and we got some great success. And so I had the courage, I think, to, to quit my job. I mean, I took that, that leap. Um, but that particular piece of it. Um, the sales were slow. I mean, we got great recognition like the American Library Association recognized us as like one of the top companies of the year, but it just wasn't turn, translating into sales. So I kept listening, kept listening. Um, and it was, again, I was just sitting in my hot tub and this idea for the Tinker Tour came up. And it just, one of the things that I think I found as a, as a holy fool um, is that um, if you listen and you just keep trusting, I mean, that trust Things just kind of fall into place, and that's really what what happened. I mean, the Tinker Tour, it was crazy. I mean, it was a, such a crazy idea. Um, I mean, that, that Mary Beth and I would, you know, get on this this pink, you know, peace sign covered bus and go around the country. Mm -hmm. But things just fell into place, and we kept getting, you know, kept getting that message that you know you're doing the right thing. And so, I mean, one of the things that we did is, uh, I mean, this just this is. I want to I want to go back to one piece. I really want people to hear from you, Mike. Um, as we continue the conversation, one of the things you said was that you thought of it as make believe, and yes. you totally transposed and transformed that to create a different experience that you called believe make. Yes. And I so love that you said it's not make believe. It's believe it, and then make it. Yeah. And it, it, was, it was so much fun to be with you, actually, here in Santa Fe at the Transformational Speaking Immersion when you hit your first fundraising goal. Yeah. And checking in every day to see if the money was there. Because what I really want people to hear from you is you just don't say, yeah, I'm going to do this, and the money shows up, and then you have your bus, and you're off doing it. It was day by day, each one of you believing it and making it so that you could reach all those kids. It is such a great Holy Fool story. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Um, um, I'd like to check in with Marie. Marie, what was the process for you of answering the call of your Holy Fool? You know, for me, it, it goes back to a time when my business was first starting, and I was trying to get things off the ground, and I think like many of us, whenever we're just starting out, we don't know what the heck we're doing, <laughs> and it can all seem really scary, and I remember at that particular time in my life, I had still a lot of baggage um, and uh, kind of toxic ideas around money and how to manage it, and here I was, this person wanted to be of tremendous service to the world and really help people, but when I would go to open my own checkbook and pay my bills every month, I would get that sense of panic because there wasn't really enough or I was afraid I was going to go under. And I remember when I started my business, I always wanted it to be about more than just me, more than just the amount of money that we could generate or the amount of profit and revenue. And I was clear that I wanted it to make a difference beyond me and beyond just the customers and the ripple effect that we could reach the actual work itself. And I heard this calling to commit a portion of the revenue that I was about to hopefully start generating through one of our group coaching programs. This is way back in the early days. 
And uh, it was an interesting moment because I was like, okay, I am personally feeling a lot of scarcity, yet I feel this super big intuitive call to commit money that I don't have right now to give it away to, to people that absolutely have less than I do. And there was a moment there of making the decision and the commitment to say, you know what? The truth in my soul knows that the world is abundant, that there is more than enough to go around. And even though I haven't experienced that fully yet, I know that to be the truth. So I need to start aligning my behaviors with what I know to be true in my soul, not what I'm afraid of in my mind. And so mm. I decided in that moment to commit, um, I don't know if it was 5 or 10 percent, and forgive me, I'm in New York City, so if you hear the faintings of a siren, that's just the product of my environment uh, mm -hmm. in the background. But I made a commitment to donate 10 percent or 5 percent of what the revenue was going to be for this program to an organization. And, you know, it's so amazing because it wound up being about $7,000. Uh, a check that I never thought that I'd be able to give that much away and it really transformed not only my relationship to my own personal wealth but it transformed the scope of who I knew I was and what I could do in service of others and it was taking that leap at the moment when I had no idea how I was going to make this happen every kind of thought in my mind was you're being dumb, you're being silly, you should wait till you have it more together, you can't even take care of yourself fully, what are you thinking of doing? And it was bypassing all of that mind chatter and being uh, obedient to what my soul knew to be true that I feel changed the entire trajectory of my career. Mm, bypassing mind chatter, that is a true skill. Any little hint you could give us there? of how when that voice goes crazy we can just say hmm, something better is emerging here yeah I mean I think there's two things you know Mike hit on it and I learned to meditate when I was 17 and that has been one of my own personal tools I meditate on a daily basis at least for 10 minutes and it allows me to stay in touch with my intuition with that higher wisdom I think that lives in each of us but that usually we're so just infatuated with listening to our mind chatter that we never slow down or get still enough to really hear the calling of our soul and I think meditation is a practice that absolutely clears that channel and keeps you plugged in but the mm -hmm. the other thing um, in terms of listening and you know it's this really simple idea of when you think about taking an action whatever that action may be for you if you pay attention to the subtlety in your body and the energy around you and you ask, you know, if I move ahead with this idea, do I feel contracted, meaning your body starts to close down, your head shakes, no, something in you just kind of wants to step away, or no matter how crazy or outrageous or wild the idea sounds, when you think about taking action on it, something in you breathes and expands and gets excited, even if it seems totally nuts. That subtle distinction between contracted and expansive, in my experience, has always been the indicator of whether or not to step into it and leap, or even if the opportunity looks good on paper, if something in me starts to pull back, that's my signal to say, I'm going to pass on this one. Ah, great. You know, as, as uh, I was talking to Manuel earlier, how the, the, the mind just can keep getting us going of what we're doing, what we're acquiring, but where's the deep wisdom? And to, to point out and to recognize it's in our body, our body knows. I see that so much in teaching speaking that we think we have to memorize all this stuff mm -hmm. and if we just allow ourselves to move into the experience we're sharing it's new and fresh every time and those details are available to us. Thanks Marie for reminding us of that deep wisdom of the body. So Mary Beth, I'm curious how you learn to trust the part of you that was directing you to change course. So this much was, was, big, was this was a big one. So much was on a feeling level because logically it was completely crazy and some of my friends <laughs> were reminding me of that, believe me. But I just 
felt that it was such a creative, crazy thing that it just might work. And then I had the great advantage of having Mike around because he's very practical. And so he really helped put this, this um, sort of wild idea into a doable form. And, and that's something that all of us holy fools need too, is, is people who are also practical. And, and he was able to help set up the um, crowd fund, fundraising project and you know our, our little miniature website. I mean, it's nothing really fancy, but I was struggling with it. And he was you know, able to pull, I mean, probably a lot of, of things like that do seem overwhelming. But they're more doable than you may think, especially if you draw on resources of, of others that you may know. So that really helped a lot. It was kind of the combination of the wild creative ideas that we had, but also we both were, I mean, I was practical in some ways also, I think. Uh, but you do need that practical part, too. To, we had so many logistics to pull, to pull off, and we went to so many schools and met with so many students um, all over the country. And so there were a lot of logistics. But it was just the feeling level, I think, more than it. And of course, Gail, you helped so much coming to your to your workshop at the very beginning before we really um, kicked off. Just made such a big difference. It really inspired us and gave us that most important tool was how to share our message from the heart. And so that helped you know, a lot. Also. And I've got to hand it to you, Mary Beth. I mean, anyone who chooses to work in the schools and inspire kids. It takes an enormous amount of energy and skill and, and constant interaction for the kids to be as inspired as they were. I loved getting pictures from you and Mike of you standing outside the bus and the tinker tour as you went around and it felt like it just kept building and building. At what point in that did you choose to quit your nursing job? I was going to try to do the nursing job on a part-time basis, but as we went along, I could see that it just wasn't going to work. And of course, I wanted to hang on because I love nursing. And I love being with the kids in the hospital, but I could see I was going to have to let something go. It just wasn't going to work. So eventually, I just was able to say goodbye after many years of working in hospitals and working as a clinical nurse. And I guess I, it sort of helped that I told myself, this is also going to help the health of young people, to teach them about their constitution and the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights and how they can use those rights to promote their own interests. Yeah. I thought well, of it as thank a, you. Thank you. Thank you for doing it in that big leap of faith. You know, it is a leap of faith, and so I'm curious that what sustains you when there's no clear evidence this darn thing's going to work? Diana, would you speak to that? Well, for me, um, every choice I make has to be about my own aliveness first. So as long as I'm committed to my own aliveness, I'll go, I'll go do anything. And mm -hmm. if, it, if I have a sense it's not going to work, I was just in a company the other day and there was a bully CEO and all these scared employees and I decided to make the choice to call this person out publicly in front of their teams and it, you could you know the air was thick with tension and there was this moment of recognizing this may not work at all I may get fired but there was this place of my tuning in to my own this is what feels most alive is to name this game that's going on so I just followed that and it reliably works for me <laughs> sounds like you kept the job <laughs> <laughs> I love it that it's about fueling your own aliveness. Mm -hmm. David White's poem, Sweet Darkness, where he says, anything or anyone that does not bring you fully alive mm -hmm. is too small for you. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I love about knowing you, Diana, that you're always going to follow that trail of life and what's going to be more expansive. Mm -hmm. And well, what sustains you? When there's no clear evidence, you have tried some holy fool things and you're in the middle of them all the time. What keeps you going? For me, it's a um, deep connection with um, the work that I do so that it becomes 
in a sense, detached from what this Cartesian culture we live in tells us. I try to detach it from results, detach it with, from the obvious, and uh, keep on it as if it was my prayer. For me, then work mm. during the times is really hard and it's really uncertain and others may not be understanding, etc. It's about staying in your prayer. And uh, in that sense, it's very liberating as well because um, if we step really into the mystery of our brief presence in, um, in this um, life and or also really our true size and the true changes that we can affect, um, it all comes back to ourselves, you know. And um, as Diana is saying, what brings you alive, what brings you fully connected. So um, giving up these constructs of hope and success, these are measurements. Um, based on the standards of others is bring the measurements to your own standards and stick to to this prayer which is a prayer in action that's what sustains me. Oh that's beautiful prayer it is a prayer in action you know one of the things you've done Manuel that you know sometimes you hear that someone's doing something outrageous and you think he's doing what with his Kumo Kumu Lab, which is really giving a place for great ideas to seed and see what they can do. Manuel took the position early on that he would not charge. He called it the gift economy, that people would give according to the value received and that Manuel would not stop a good project because the money wasn't there. And I know you didn't have the money to fund it, Manuel. Tell me about how that has worked for you, because that's a bold move that I think is still an experiment. Yes, it is still an experiment. I mean, scarcity and fear are so ingrained in all our beliefs and cultural constructs around us that when you really step outside of that into complete trust in abundance, and also the sense that the payment, quote unquote payment for what you're giving may not be given to you but to somebody else, the idea not of pay, payback mm -hmm. or reciprocity but paying forward, is very scary. And um, you know, I'm still still tinkering with it and uh, struggling with it, and, uh, but it's sticking to it. And I, I know that if we, Kumu is, is a place for new narratives for transformation, for cultural transformation, and it will be hypocritical that we ourselves didn't bet on our own transformation very strongly. So that's why from the inception of this organization, it, I decided it has to be a gift economy organization. It has to be like that, and we have to go all in. And, um, you know, it's still evolving. We're still um, Trying to find an economic model, uh, fundraising, etc. It's also such a novel idea that um, it's taking a while to magnetize, to invite the the alignment of people who have resources and, and want to support us. But I, I'm going to do it anyway. You know, but you knowing <laughs> knowing you as I do, you have one of the richest most full live, loving lives with relationships and ideas and passion of anyone I've ever known and however you manage not to let that financial pressure as you as you walk through it you don't let it steal your joy there's something in you that's just so alive and joyful no matter what is there I hear the prayer, I hear the commitment. Is there anything else you'd like to share about how you stay in that beautiful, loving space of yours? Yeah, well, it was, I think the ultimate revolutionary and dangerous act for our times is to be satisfied and to be happy. This culture <laughs> is satisfaction. You know, so yeah. we need to leave, we need the other thing, we need to. It's so excruciating to be on that car of that wheel. The moment you decide you're happy, you're satisfied, and and um, you connect to to the foundations, healthy foundations of your own uh, self, your own wisdom, your own power, and um, and step in that vulnerability, then the game really opens to infinite possibilities. Um, so it's really daring to do that. To it's really stepping out of the matrix. Is what happens when you commit to to be in yourself oh. and to be happy and satisfied no matter what. 
super dangerous for this culture. Ah, I love it. A radical act to be satisfied. Hear that? Do you all see this holy fool over my shoulder here? She's, yeah. she's taking that one in. Always that radical act of being satisfied with what is, but not letting it shut down the amazing possibilities that the holy fool in us know can happen. Yeah, and always surround yourself with advisors too, like uh, <laughs> I wrote my own. Surround yourself with like-minded people. <laughs> totally. <laughs> they may not be the same species, but hey, whatever mm. does it. So, Marie, I'm curious, what gifts have come your way because of your willingness to be a holy fool for what you oh know to be true? Goodness, what gifts are we talking about on the uh, material plane? Are we talking about on the spiritual plane, on all of them? Let's see. I could go on and on and on and not stop talking. I think uh, the gifts have been absolutely endless. I think starting from the inside, um, being willing to be a holy fool on a regular basis has me feeling as though I am doing the work in the world that I am meant to do. It has me connecting to the most incredible human beings, both people that I work with, people that I have the chance to connect with through my work, and then other people who I never dreamed of being able to connect with and get to know and to get to understand. I think on a physical plane, I have always had big dreams for myself and what we'd be able to create and what we'd be able to give, and I keep surpassing what I think is possible, and it's a little mind-blowing in the best way, where it's like, I feel like I have to keep breathing and going, is this real? Oh my goodness, can it get any better? <laughs> And so it's a never-ending adventure, and it feels, um, in terms of gifts, just this expansion, continuous expansion of love and possibility beyond what I could have ever imagined. It's beautiful to watch your Marie TV and the people you speak with and the wonderful ideas that, you know, I think once we step out, you, everything shows up to fuel that next step. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't mean that everything works all the time. We're not trying to say that. When you look at someone who's got, you know, figured out a, a model that really works to support yourself and your team and others and better ideas in the world. But the gifts are so much more than financial. Is would someone else like to add to the gifts you've received because of your willingness to be a holy fool? I will. Um, I want to emphasize something that Marie said, which I think is a key part of being a holy fool, and that is you have to be willing to blow your own mind for what you <laughs> And so I actually think that's one of the great gifts I've been given, is that to, to open up to possibilities that literally I could not have imagined possible, to be willing to get surprised over and over by what reality can be, is it's delightful. I think it's the best part of being a fool. Thank you. Who else? What gifts have come your way? I'll add it, it, it. It's just fun. I mean, it's a it's a fun way to live. Um, it's uh, it's scary as heck sometimes, but um, you know, one of the things that that ended up uh, that we did on the uh, at the end of the Tinker Tour with the Hefner Foundation, uh, Hugh Hefner, the Playboy folks. They gave us an award, and um, I mean, and again, you get you just things keep showing up like that that you know you just don't expect. But I actually got home um, last night um, because the Hefner had invited me back. I got to go to the Playboy Mansion where I got to you know actually you know judge next year's awards. Um, and I think I told you about that one business um, that we started that you know kind of gave me the courage to leave um, my law school, my, my law career, um, the home history book and everything, you know, and it didn't, didn't work. And so I was like, what did I just do? But then the Tinker Tour came up. Well, one of the things I did yesterday at the Playboy Mansion is I gave Hugh Hefner a home history book for the Playboy Mansion. So, I mean, just weird stuff like that, you know, it just happens and it's just fun and it's scary, but it's fun. Yeah, sitting in that hot tub, you weren't thinking, hmm, 
how do I win a Hugh Hefner First Amendment <laughs> Rights Award? You probably weren't, it wasn't even on your radar. Not at all. But then by this willingness to just keep stepping forward and doing the work, this whole new world opens. So yeah, Diana, I love what you said, be willing to blow your own mind. Because that step of the holy fool into the unknown. And well, I know you work with the tarot quite a bit. Talk to us about the fool card in the tarot. It sounds like it fits right here. Oh yeah. Well, um, here it is. Um, <laughs> Let so, us see it. I didn't quite get. Let's see. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna see it. There. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So yeah, this is the Marseille tarot, which is the the oldest. Um, that has been uh, reconstructed, and I, I use it quite a bit because of the power of its archetypes. I know it's got a bad reputation because of the predictive use of it, uh, but it's really a beautiful um, metaphoric landscape for our lives. And um, this card of the fool uh, is the beginner that is going to do it no matter what. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know when, but he's starting on a journey. He's dynamic, he's moving, his eyes are kind of going a little bit up, Towards, and if you like the whole tarot in a certain way, it coincides with the star, another card which is the star. So he's seeing the star and that's it. He has a little hobo pack, that's all he needs for now. And what I think is really beautiful, and it's actually what got me kind of hooked to the archetypal um, landscape of the tarot, is this little doggy that is kind of jumping and biting him in the, in the butt and tearing his pants. <laughs> but this is his only friend and companion for the journey, this dog. And that represents our ego. So the wisdom of this card is that our ego uh, comes behind us and that we should have the relationship with the ego that we would have with uh, uh, a dog we love, where we love and support and nurture this creature, but at the same time we always make it a daily and, and hourly discipline to, put, to remind the dog that he's a dog and he has to wait and he has to not now and go behind us. So it's this beautiful relationship with the ego that um, that I th I found was terrific when we hear in our culture so often that we need to kill our ego. Well, no, we just need to make sure the ego comes to support us and that we're not supporting it. So, yeah, it's a powerful and beautiful image. And, um, yeah. I, I love it. Just, just that little hobo bag is all you need right now to take that step forward into the unknown. And that is what the holy fool is willing to do, to listen to that little spark of madness that's saying, yeah, you, but right now, why not? And so we'll, we'll have a bit more holy fool wisdom in a minute, but as I mentioned, I got to know all of these holy fools through transformational speaking and as a result of, of this Holy Fool's Day event I've been getting lots of questions from people about what is it about this training that's surprising. I think it's probably pretty clear to people and I don't care about putting a lot of techniques out there and just designing a speech that there's the Holy Fool inside that wants to be expressed and that's part of this transformational speaking journey. So I'm curious from any of you, what was the surprise for you in our work together? And how did our transformational speaking work support your journey as a holy fool? I'm happy to jump in and start this party. So uh, Gail, I've told you this many times uh, personally and through email your workshop over the past summer was one of the most powerful things I've done for myself in recent years. What was surprising to me, although it wasn't really surprising because I had a feeling about how incredibly gifted you are, but what was so refreshing to me was how much growth and transformation could take place in such a short amount of time. And for me, you know, I've done big events, I've led them, I've participated in them, and it was so wonderful to be in a small, nurturing, safe environment and to get that much feedback and to be able to workshop so much um, in a very intimate space. No one else is doing work like you do. Everyone's trying to go bigger, 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 bigger and this is um, quite the opposite and it's exactly what it should be. 
And I forget the second part of your question, but all I know is that I felt like I came home from Santa Fe like somewhat as a different woman, paradoxically, but really the truth was I came home more myself than ever and was able to reconnect with the deepest parts of who I am that can sometimes start to get a little disconnected with all of the hustle and bustle and running a team and, and being all over the place. So for me, it was very healing spiritually. It was very um, eye-opening. And it was uh, incredibly, incredibly useful from the tools and the ideas and the philosophies that you share. And also, the depth of your knowledge. You are one of the most masterful facilitators I have ever experienced in my life. The way that you hold space, the way that you um, orchestrate and choreograph everything is absolutely impeccable. Thank you, Marie. Hmm, that self-trust, that being more of who we are. Absolutely, that's aligned with the intention of what this will, what this draws forward. Anyone else want to add anything to that? I'll be happy to. I, <clears throat> well, I, I just want to add big ditto, ditto, ditto to um, to what was just said. Um, I felt um, exactly the same. It was profoundly transformational and revealing of my my own true self, and. Um, in addition to all that and uh, just how wonderful your, your work is, um, um, I think what was really helpful is that you helped me get a lens um, so I could look at myself in the context of the world. You know, it's, it's not that easy to understand what parts of ourselves um, the world wants to hear and the world wants to see. There's a little disconnect when we go in public, you know, it's what should I show, you know, what type of mask should I wear? Um, and you just clear all that smoke for me very fantastically and gave me a very powerful lens to understand what it takes to be a powerful speaker, to be a truthful speaker, and also help me understand what my gifts and my medicine are so I can share them uh, more powerfully in the world. So uh, I'll be forever grateful for it. Thank you so well, much. Kate. Thank you, Manuel. You brought up the term medicine. and. For me, this, this, this teaching is, is about totally understanding what is called in original cultures, original medicine. The understanding that we each have a gift that's nowhere else duplicated. And that if we don't express it, it's lost to the world for all time. So my intention in the training is when you know that medicine, not as a concept, but deeply embodied claiming it, is the truth of who you are and then you know the message you're here to speak it becomes so much easier because you're going to simplify your decisions you're going to amplify your voice so this is some of the foundational work we do before ever going out to think about what a speech would look like Diana do you have something to add to that yeah the thing I got most surprised about from the training was I had done a lot of work looking at my original medicine, but there was something about being with you and finding a new sort of, uh, what I would call like a sacred devotion to it that I, um, I never had had before in the same way. So I feel more of my personality getting out of the way to allow that original medicine to come through and it has brought me a new kind of courage uh, that, that I just didn't have and so it lives in me so deeply and it's um, so unarguable and I see its value in a way I could never see before. I think much of because of the reflection you gave me uh, in, the, in your own um, deeply present place. Mm. I love that you told me after a talk a few months ago that you were, I think at the Wisdom 2.0 uh, conference and speaking and that at some point in the middle of that you said how would I be doing this if I were standing fully in my medicine mm -hmm. and how everything shifted in terms of your experience in that moment yeah, so and I was speaking so easy if I just speak from the med let the medicine speak not me that was the big game changer mm -hmm. ah yeah yeah a lot of deep trust uh, with deep knowing first so we have to know it so we can trust it and then and then bring that forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything, anything else that you want to add? I want to say just a little bit about the online academy. Mike, 
I just want to say Bless one thing. You. I actually give you a lot of credit for the Tinker Tour itself. I mean, I actually had just read your book um, before the Tinker Tour was even out there in the universe. Um, and uh, but when the idea for it came, it was just like we've got to go. We've got to go talk to Gail. I mean, this whole notion: if you want to change the world, uh, tell a better story. Um, I mean, that's what we were. That's what the Tinker Tour was all about. Um, and yeah, I, I I think both Mary Beth and I. Um, it just kind of came together um, in Santa Fe, so thank you. Mm. For that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Your, I think your message would re will resonate with anyone who cares about their deeper self and healing the world and making a better world. The idea of the original met medicine really resonates with I know it's a Native American idea, but it also kind of helped me put together the nursing idea with my new life because it's a different kind of nursing, it's a different kind of healing and everything that we did together really resonated and helped me to to just feel at a deep level that this is the way to move forward, to make, to make a better world, to help make a contribution and I think it was kind of surprising that it turned out to be so much fun <laughs> and it's uh, always it's fun it was fun and, yeah. and I'm happy there yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And so a, a question I've been getting a lot this week is how can you can you do this online and have the same experience? Because the online academy has now been operating for a year, I can say yes. May not the same experience obviously, but people have 8 months to go through the course. I'm there in phone calls on Facebook. There's coaching when you need it. And people are finding, because of the videos we're posting and so forth, a really rich learning community for this journey with the time to do it at your own pace as opposed to let's get together for four days and do it. So we'll send a follow-up um, to give you a link to learn more about it. And we do have two special offers. There's, there's a $300 discount that goes through the 13th. And if you sign up by next Monday, there's an additional half hour private coaching with me anytime in the eight month membership for transformational speaking online. So I promised you four questions to help activate your holy fool for those of you who are watching. These are questions that I think if we all answered, our world would change because we'd be tuned in to what we are here to express. The first question is what delights you and brings you alive? As you see and hear from our holy fools today, you can tell they're pretty turned on to this. They found how they want to be expressing at this time in their lives. If it's not joyful, it isn't yours to be doing. That vibration of joy moves mountains. The second one is what breaks your heart. What are the things that are so challenging to even look at in the world that you want to turn away? I would propose that that's a place you're being called to bring your love and service and your voice. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but when something breaks our heart, it means we're being asked to look. The third one is, what does healing look like? I always suggest to people I work with, we've got to be telling the new story. If you want to change the world, tell a better story. Tell a new story. And sometimes now we are making up that new story so that others can see a possibility of the world as how it could exist. So what does healing look like? When you look at what it is that breaks your heart, what's on the other side of that? And what's the new story you want to tell? And then the last question, what one life-affirming action will you do beautifully and consistently with love? And sometimes in speaking, that's your call to action to others. Join me in this. It matters. So there are four simple questions, but they really require that we look deeply inside 
to say, what am I really here to say? What am I really here to express? And how do I begin putting my voice out in the world? So as we wrap up, what's left unsaid, holy fools? Is there something more that you want to add or some exhortation to all the holy fools in training, listening in? Aha! Look at that, <laughs> Diana! <laughs> She was not going to be upstaged by Manuel. <laughs> <laughs> so as a, a human being, I have a reptilian brain, and my reptilian brain goes <laughs> crazy sometimes. And I have really learned to love my reptilian brain, love my humanity, love the parts of me that get scared and want to control and uh, and love it in other people. So I would say that's one of the other things that all holy fools I know um, embody is this willingness to play with our humanity and that uh, crazy part of us that believes there's some threat out there when there really isn't. <laughs> that's so stunning. Oh, and look at Manuel here. What do you have to report? Well, I just... This actually, this is not props. This is things I have in my desk anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also have my uh, uh, Che Guevara finger puppet. Um, so <laughs> I think um, fun is is one of the is one of the messages. You know, meaningful f uh, and uh, world changing uh, fun. Uh, life is short. We don't know how long it is, um, and it's just the best thing one can do is to embrace. Um, uh, our own holy fullness and align ourselves, you know, with, with the true being and go for it. You know, it's just so fun. It's, it's the best thing ever. So that's my message to holy fools is like, let's play. Let's play more. <laughs> let's play. Let's play. <laughs> Marie, you want to jump in there? What's your final exhortation for inspiring our holy fool? I think it's all about putting on your rose-colored or badass sunglasses and looking at that vision of the world as you would like to see it be and then as Mike said believe it and make it happen. You've got a vision in there, let's have a good time, let's make this change and let's have fun while we do it. Thank you. Mike? You know what I would say is um, just listen. I mean, that, that's the thing that just helped me the most, was just taking a moment to, to, to listen. Uh, my new motto is kind of, I guess I can say this because it's streamed, um, the universe effing loves me. I mean, and if you just listen, um, you, you know that. You, you, you notice that. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's the big thing for me. And Mary Beth. And I am celebrating today with all of you the new world that we are bringing and our creativity and our imagination, our willingness to take risks and to do things that may seem a little crazy but that we have trust and faith that this is the way that we will create a new world, a better world, a more equal and just and, and humane world for everyone. And so I'm celebrating, I'm so happy to be all with all of you today on this Holy Fool's Day and I just thank you Gail so much for the gift that you are in my life. Thank you. Thank you. I, would, I just want to say I have so much fun in my work because of meeting holy fools who are ready to rock it and to bring your love and your power and your capacity to making a world that works for all. I can't seem to get a hat on me here. If I had one, my hat would be off to you. But Let's just have a little applause. <laughs> thank, thank you, holy fools. Thank Until you, Gail. Until next time. And for everyone out there, take a holy fool action today. Let this be the inspiration to destroy your reputation. Be notorious. Much love, everyone. Thanks for playing. Love Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.